I think the smoke went away now that David and Ram are, are gone. Um, interesting. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for the invitation to Chicago. I come to you from that place that David was talking about, that Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, we're the people that brought you the sequester and the shutdown. So <laughs> you're welcome, America. I'm very great about that. So uh, I'm glad to be. Never before in my life have I been happier to not be in D.C. than, than I am today. So it's clear that we've got a problem in our political system. Um, and uh, it's not working very well. In fact, it's actually not working at all. At all. Um, and we've spent a lot of time uh, in Washington uh, on a lot of these uh, cable shows and other places talking about why the system doesn't work. And there's a lot of blame to go around, all right? The mayor just brought up redistricting. It's a problem, there's no doubt about it. 96% of uh, Democrats right now sit in districts that Barack Obama carried. 94% of Republicans sit in districts that Mitt Romney carried. There are very, very few people who sit in those mythical swing districts. Safe incumbents mean there's no consequence for bad action, right? They're nice and insulated from getting ousted in November. And then there's money, right? Money's always the problem. Super PACs are out there spending like crazy. $457 million was spent by super PACs just in the House and Senate races alone in 2012. And by the way, none of that was like fluffy positive spending, right? These were all on those negative attack ads with the grainy pictures and the deep resonant voice telling you how terrible a candidate or another person was. So, we got those two things working for us. The media is always a problem, as usual. We, we contribute to this problem in Washington, the, uh, the polarization. We live off of conflict. We like to promote disunity. We, we like to talk about the bad, not so much about the good. And then there's Twitter. You throw that in the mix where people are sending around information. It doesn't really matter if it's actually true or not. It's just important to get it out and get it out quickly and eventually it will work its way out and we'll find the truth somewhere out there, maybe not, but you were the first person that tweeted it. You got a lot of retweets on that, so good for you for doing that. That could be the other issue. Um, the president's the problem, right? You heard Leon Panetta, actually, his former defense secretary uh, yesterday in a meeting with a bunch of reporters actually pretty much call out the president for not showing enough leadership not, not rolling his sleeves up enough in these negotiations. There are a lot of Democrats and Republicans that you talk to in Washington who say the president's not engaged enough. He doesn't really like the legislating process. He hasn't built the relationships that you need to build in order to get people to do things they don't want to do. So he could be part of the problem. The Tea Party, right? We know that they're supposedly they're part of the problem. They, uh, there's a marriage of convenience between the Tea Party faction and the Republicans, and right now they need to be in counseling. I um, <laughs> think we're headed toward the road to divorce here. Um, so those are all, those are part of the problem, but it's not just others that are the problem. I mean, it's easy to, to point to all those and, and just walk away, throw up your hands and say, the heck with all of them. But you know, we're part of the problem too, and by we, I mean the voting public, the general public. Um, we are not as innocent, uh, just innocent bystanders to this process. The first thing is, is something that um, a uh, journalist named Bill Bishop wrote about in 2008 in a book he calls the big, a book called The Big Sort. And in it he talks about the fact that over the last 30 years there's been a very interesting migration in America. And it's a migration that's based not on economics, right? people moving to different parts of the country because that's where the jobs are, but people are moving more and more and moving to places that align with their own political points of view. And I, I wrote down his, uh, a quote that he had because I thought this was quite telling. And see if you can put yourself in the situation. He says, as Americans have moved over the past three decades, they've clustered in communities of sameness among people with similar ways of life, beliefs, 
and in the end, politics. And we've seen it in the numbers. In 1992, only 30% of Americans lived in counties that gave one party or the other 60% or more of the vote. Today, more than half of Americans live in a county where one party or the other wins in a landslide. All right, and it's not just because of redistricting, it's that we have put ourselves in these bubbles. We are doing it unconsciously, says Bishop, but we're doing it anyway. And so we're all in these little bubbles. We live in our bubbles, and then we send our bubbles to Washington, and those bubbles end up there, and they don't, they just bounce off of each other. And then we wonder why nobody's talking to each other, but we're not talking to each other either, um, even in our own communities. Another person who I, I, I think has a very good point about you know, how we got here, and um, we as Americans are responsible. So she's a political scientist from Stony Brook, her name's Lillian Mason, and she also looked at behavior over the last 30 years, and she found that Americans aren't more polarized on issues. In fact, they, are, they agree on more than they, than they disagree on. But she wrote, it's not that we're angry because we disagree so strongly about important issues. Instead, we're angry, at least partially, because of team spirit, okay? In other words, I have a blue jersey, you have a red jersey, I have a red jersey, you have a blue jersey. That's what I talk about first. We may agree, I, I don't disagree with your policy, but I disagree with the color jersey you're wearing. So I'm not even gonna listen to you in the first place. Um, we have, now, our, the, the commentary has gotten stronger even though we don't have uh, beliefs that are that far from one another. Okay, so those are all the, the problems. And there is a way, though, I think, for a solution. And there's time, actually, that we should be talking. We should be talking much more about solutions rather than just focusing on all the problems. I'm not saying this is going to end the paralysis in Washington, but I think it's a start. And that's looking at the thing that we don't talk about that much, which is the primary process. And it's a place where all of us can participate. We can't do much about money in politics. You can't change the way that the media is talking about issues. You're not gonna change what's happening at the White House. But you can participate in the process. Uh, we talked about this, uh, we've been talking about this, I'm sure we'll continue to talk about this, so the redistricting process, the safe seats. So we now have to recognize we're in a different era where the general election is not as important as the primary election. If most incumbents are safe, the only election they worry about is not the one in November, but the one that happens here in March or in other states in September or August or July. And right now, they are catering to their base because only the base turns out. Now, if you look at the primary process, you say, well, the reason only the base turns out is because primaries are rigged, right? And it's true, there are a whole lot of states where the, uh, the opportunity to vote in it is limited. There are 24 states or state parties where you have to be registered with that party to vote in their primary. You can't be registered as an independent. You, as a Democrat, can't vote in a Republican primary, vice versa. But there are a whole bunch of states where that's not true. Illinois is one of them. Um, there are a whole bunch of states where there's no registration at all by party. You just show up on election day, you pick a ballot. You can't vote in every primary. You just pick Dem or Republican, and you go and vote. California has a process they just instituted in 2012, California is kind of a big state, so it's sort of important to watch how they do this. The top two vote getters, regardless of party, move on to the November election. So you have one ballot, everybody's on it, Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever other party, and it doesn't matter what party they are from, if they are in first or second place, they go on to November. That should open it up too, right? The theory being the more moderate candidate can get out of a primary, Maybe even an independent can get to the general election. Um, but one thing all three of these primaries have in common is that nobody shows up to vote in them, okay? Um, how many people here vote in their primaries? Yeah, you guys are... I shouldn't even ask that. You guys are dorks who are showing up at 7.30 to listen to a bunch of people talk about politics. 
You aren't the problem. I just set myself up for that disaster. Maybe people in the balcony don't vote. Um, <laughs> I didn't see them. But on average, you get 15, 20, maybe, if you're lucky, 30% turnout in election. Doesn't matter. I looked at open primaries, closed primaries, California primaries. It's all the same. We referenced Ted Cruz earlier. In that primary in 2012, again, Texas open primary, 1.4 million people voted in the 2012 Texas Senate Republican primary. To give you some context, there are 1.1 million voters registered in Dallas alone. All right, 1.8 million voters in Harris County, which is Houston, alone. 1.4 million people total showed up to vote. There are uh, about 30, well, we've, we've named 33 at the Cook Political Report. We have 33 uh, House Republicans that we've dubbed the Hell No Caucus because they are not voting for anything that even has the imprint of bipartisanship uh, on it. Uh, they voted against every piece of legislation that the speakers put on the floor that had, uh, did not have 218 Republican votes, things like the debt ceiling limit in 2011 or the Sandy aid uh, for the hurricane victims. Um, of those 33, 70% of them sit in states that have open primaries, okay? So uh, there are a whole bunch of opportunities here for people to have an impact if they actually show up to vote. And again, I, I understand it. You watch this process, you see the silliness in Washington, and you say, I'm just going to throw my hands up. It doesn't matter, All right? These guys are going to do whatever they're going to do. And they will. I mean, we get the government that we vote for, and when only 20% of people vote, then you get a government that represents the 20%. And the only way that changes is that, whether it's, it's civic associations, the ones who now spend so much time trying to get us to turn out and vote in November, they've got to change the discussion. They've got to start talking about the importance of getting out to vote in a primary election, especially in places where they know that the general election is not competitive in the least bit. Your vote matters now more than ever before November. By November, it's too late. So those civic groups, the rock the votes and the uh, no labels and all those different groups, I would argue should be focusing their attention there rather than putting so much of it in the presidential. It's not as sexy as a presidential election, but I think it could have much more of an impact. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, Government's going to go on with or without you. People are going to get elected with or without you. You can vote, you cannot vote. This is still, we're still going to move on, even though I know it seems like the end of days and the apocalypse is coming and locusts are going to start descending and all that. But it, it will still go on. But if we want a government that is about the majority, then a majority of the people need to start showing up and voting for it. Thank you very much.